Welcome back future BCPS graduates. This video lesson is for lesson two during the week of May 18th to 22nd, where we will explore multiple works from a literary time period. The learning objective today has two parts, learning how to examine a variety of works to compare how two texts from the same time period treat a common theme. In gold, you will see that the two works you are examining are two texts that you may have already explored in your remote learning. If you need to review these texts, revisit your work from the weeks of May 11th and lesson one of this week. The common theme that you will analyze is identity. Let's get started. To begin this lesson, think about the Harlem Renaissance and modernism. What are the intersections of these two movements? The information that you learned about these movements can be reviewed by revisiting lesson one during the week of May 11th and lesson one of this week remote learning. When considering this question, think about the big picture. What historical events preceded the movements? Who were the important figures and what did they hope to accomplish? What did the work produced during these movements hope to emphasize? Here are some of the answers that you may have come up with. It is important to consider the intersectionality, that is to say the similarities and the differences of both movements as you seek to compare the two texts for today's lesson. The influence of the literary movement impacts how each text develops the theme of identity. Let's talk briefly about the sociological approach to literary criticism. You may already know some of this information, but if not, it is important to get a general understanding of what we mean when we say the sociological approach. When we talk about literary criticism, think about a magnifying lens. By looking through a magnifying lens, you enlarge something to get a better understanding of it. Literary criticism works the same way. By focusing on a method or an approach to reading a text, we can understand it in a new and different way. The sociological approach focuses on the relationship between literature and the society in which it was written or set in. Writers can affirm, which means to agree, reinforce, or perpetuate, or they can criticize, which means to go against or disagree with, the values of the society in which they live. It is important to note that even if the work does not make an obvious argument for or against the values of the society in which it was written, it is likely that social issues are still addressed in the characters, the conflicts, the settings, etc. Asking the right questions is the key to a successful analysis. The questions we ask will guide the way that we think about a text. When selecting a question to ask, think about both common questions that a sociological critic would ask, as well as the content and style of the work that you are exploring. We will first review the common questions that are asked, and then I will help you to think about which questions might be right for the two texts that you are investi investigating today. First, let's think about general questions that look at the big picture. When you are thinking about the microcosm of the work that you are focusing on, think about the characters, conflicts, events, and settings of that story. Then think about how those elements of the story relate to the society of the author. So for example, in a work of fiction, this means how do the made up elements relate to the real historic events or people or places. In a work of nonfiction, like Hurston's essay, this means we need to consider how what was happening to Zora Neale Hurston and her reaction to it might relate to that which was happening outside of her experience. So how does Hurston's essay relate to what was taking place during the Harlem Renaissance? These questions relate specifically to how the work addresses the influence of wealth and the, the direct or indirect influence that might have on the characters in the story. 
So let's think about a story that you might already be familiar with, such as William Golding's Lord of the Flies. In that story, the ability to provide food could be seen as currency. The hunters, led by Jack, are given an elevated sat status in the tribe because of their ability to provide food. This reflects a capitalist society where private citizens can profit directly from a free market of products and ideas. So what's happening economically in the story reflects what's happening economically in the society in which it was written. When you're investigating the economics, you wanna think about what does the work say about economic or social power? Who has it and who doesn't? Does the story address issues of economic exploitation, one group of people taking advantage of another economically? What is the role of money in that exploitation? And how do the economic conditions determine the direction of the character's lives? These questions go beyond the role of money to think about other social forces or hierarchies that influence the power and opportunities of the characters in the story. Usually the social forces at play in the story surface in the conflicts surrounding the main character or protagonist. So let's keep going with our Lord of the Flies example. In Lord of the Flies, the boys are divided by age and size. They're called the biggins and the little ones. The biggins can make shelter, they can hunt, and they can debate what should be done on the island. The little ones are at the mercy of the biggins because they do not have the ability to participate in these important tasks. This reflects and criticizes how prominent members of our own society, thinking about like big businesses or political leaders, have power and influence over others. So we're thinking about how do the social forces shape the power relationships between groups or classes of people in the story? Who has power and who doesn't? Does the work challenge or affirm the social order that it depicts? And can the protagonist struggle be seen as symbolic of a larger class struggle? These questions reflect the role of government or the type of society that influences the story. For example, if we're thinking about Lord of the Flies, you might wanna think about how Ralph and the other boys originally organize a democracy at the beginning of the story. They all vote on who should be the leader and what should be done. Eventually, later in the story, Jack forms his own group of boys and he leads them as a dictator with absolute power he makes all the decisions and decides what they should do and when they should do it. This dynamic in the story reflects the conflicts between governments in the society in which it was written. Lord of the Flies being written right after World War II um, demonstrates the conflict between democratic government and more um, authoritative government. So when we're thinking about politics, we're thinking about how the story might reflect the great American dream, how it might reflect urban, rural, or suburban values, or whether or not any of the characters correspond to types of government, like how Ralph represented a democratic society, whereas Jack represented a dictatorship. What attitudes toward these political structures or systems are, are expressed in the work? You're going to take the role of a sociological critic by selecting two questions found on the previous slides and answering them for each of the texts um, signed today. You can choose either two questions that can be applied to both texts, or you can select questions that work specifically for one text or the other. The only requirement is that you have two questions that are answered for each text. You're gonna use relevant and precise evidence from each text to answer each question fully in a short answer format. Both texts provide opportunities to explore the general overall questions and the questions pertaining to social order. You may use any of these six questions as a tool to investigate the social forces at work in either of the stories for today.
A soldier for the crown offers the opportunity to explore the economics of the society in which it is set and written in. Any of these questions can be used as a tool to explore the social forces at work in A Soldier for the Crown. Either of the first two questions under the politics section can be used to explore the social forces at work in Zora Neale Hurston's essay. You want to think about how her essay communicates her personal experiences and perceptions of her identity. How is Hurston influenced by her move from rural Florida to urban New York? How does this affirm or criticize the value of either place? Think about her interactions and experiences with people from both settings. Finally, you are going to show what you know by writing a thematic analysis. Take the work that you did during the try it section and simply expand on it to think about how each text treats the theme of identity. What is similar about each author's message about identity and how the values of, of its society influence the story? What social issues influence how Alexander Freeman and Zora Neale Hurston view themselves? You may organize your response based on the text. You might first talk about one text and then the other, or you can organize it based on the topic, having each paragraph focus on one topic, but addressing each text. You want to be thinking about your knowledge of the Harlem Renaissance and the modern American literary movement in your response. You may use any of the knowledge that you've gained in order to expand on what you've written in the try it section of today's lesson. You're gonna write your response a total of eight to 10 sentences in the space provided. Thank you for joining me on this week's edition of BCPS TV for English 11 during the week of May 18th to the 22nd. Hello and welcome to ELA grade 12 for the week of May 18th for lessons one and two. For this week of English 12, you will be completing an end of unit writing prompt in lesson two. You have the option of choosing between either of the following prompts. Option one, compose an argument that supports or rejects the following proposition. Man has gone too far in manipulating nature. Use evidence from at least two of the texts you've studied to develop your claims and support your reasoning. You may also choose to use evidence and examples from other texts or your background knowledge to support your ideas. As you write, be sure to use an organizational structure and style that supports your ideas in a clear, convincing, and engaging manner. You would likely choose this option if you focus mostly on the informational texts about genetic modification or felt like those are the texts that connected with you most. Option two, each individual's experience in nature reflects his or her social, economic, and educational foundation. After reading Dwellings, Living Like Weasels, and a nature poem of your choice, plan and write a personal narrative in which you describe and reflect on a memorable encounter or experience you have had in nature. How did this experience lead you to an insight about your own life or about the human condition? So you would likely choose this option if you focus mostly on the literary texts about nature or felt like those were the ones that most connected with you. If you are choosing to complete prompt option one, you will complete lesson one, option one today. If you are choosing to complete prompt option two, you will complete lesson one, option two for today. So at this point, I will go through lessons one and two for option one. I will support you through the learning tasks in lesson one and explain the writing task in lesson two. After I've gone over option one, I will go through option two in the same way, supporting you through the learning tasks in lesson one and then explaining the writing task in lesson two. So feel free to watch the portion of this lesson that is most relevant to your path. Lesson one, option one, you will analyze arguments about genetic modification in order to evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of each. So think about this, when you break down or analyze an argument, what are you looking for? When you evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of an argument, what do you need to consider about the information presented in the argument? 
You may want to think back to unit three when you learned about types of claims and reasoning, your understanding of fallacious arguments, and the ways that authors use rhetoric to build strong arguments. Now you will read two articles on genetic modification, one advocating for the use of genetic modification and the other arguing against it. Read both articles annotating to analyze the development of the arguments. If you can, hit pause on your screen right now and complete your reading and annotating. If you aren't able to pause this, follow along for the remainder of this lesson segment, making some notes along the way, and then go back and complete the lesson in the order provided to you. Now that you've read and annotated the two articles on genetic modification, let's review types of claims and reasoning so that you can brush up on your skills and knowledge in preparation for evaluating each argument. You may want to take some notes on these next several slides if you're struggling to remember this information. First, we have claims of fact or truth. These assert that something is or is not true. They assert that something happened, is happening, or will happen, and the speaker here wants the audience to accept the claim as true. You may notice in these claims words like is, causes, leads to, destroys, or improves. Claims of policy recommend a future course of action. Here the speaker wants the audience to agree that something should or should not be done. And you may hear words like should, should not, or must in these claims. Claims of value state that something or someone does or does not have worth. The speaker here wants the audience to accept, accept their judgment. You may find words like better, best, worse, good, or bad in claims of value. These are words that essentially make a claim about the value of something. So look for those descriptor words in claims of value. So why do we care about different types of claims? When you take note of the type of claim being made by an author, it can help you to identify reasons given to support the claim, and more importantly, to evaluate the claim's validity. Sometimes authors use claims as reasons and in doing so provide only an opinion to support a claim. For example, an author may provide a claim of fact or truth and try to support that claim with a claim of policy. So if my claim is that genetic modification will have catastrophic long-term consequences and the reason I provide to support that is that people shouldn't take laws of nature into their own hands, I've essentially given you an opinion to back up a debatable claim rather than providing you with a reason that can be backed by solid evidence. Therefore, if you were evaluating my argument, you would be doubtful of its overall strength. When you know what kinds of claims are presented in an argument, you can ask yourself different questions depending on the type of claim. So for claims of truth or fact, you can ask yourself, why is this true? For claims of policy, you can say, why is it good or bad that we do this or that this happens or doesn't happen? For claims of value, you can ask yourself, why should I believe that? And asking yourself these questions will not only help you identify the reasoning used, but will also help you to determine if the reasons given fully answer your question as you evaluate the argument. So let's review the definitions of inductive and deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is often thought of as bottom-up reasoning. This is a method of argument in which the writer first presents evidence about an issue or problem and then draws a conclusion from it. The conclusion presents the writer's belief about what should be done or how the issue or problem should be resolved. This type of reasoning involves looking for a trend or pattern and then generalizing from that data. Deductive reasoning is often viewed as top-down reasoning. This is a method of argument in which the writer begins with a claim of fact that is followed by supporting evidence that proves the claim to be true. This type of reasoning involves taking a set of data or facts to deduce more facts. So again, why do we care about types of reasoning? When you look at the evidence given in an argument, you can determine if it is being used deductively or inductively. And as you're examining the use of the evidence, you also want to consider if it is relevant to the claim and thorough enough to fully prove that the claim is true in the case of deductive reasoning or to show that the claim is probable in the case of inductive reasoning. And don't forget to be on the lookout for fallacies. Remember that fallacies are common errors in reasoning that will undermine the logic of an argument. 
Now you'll complete the Evaluating Arguments Organizer to evaluate the two opposing arguments about genetic modification. That will close out Lesson 1 for Option 1, so let's take a quick look at your writing task in Lesson 2. So let's first revisit the prompt from the very beginning of this lesson segment. When you compose an argument in response to this prompt, you'll need to consider what you've read about genetic modification. Remember that you've learned about the genetic modification of the malaria carrying mosquito, as well as the genetic modification of food, in addition to what you've read in lesson one from this week. Thinking through all those points made, you'll want to develop your own position on whether or not it is ethical for man to manipulate nature and to what extent. So you want to think about, have we gone too far with genetic modification? You may use the argument organizer to plan your writing and be sure to review the rubric provided to ensure your writing meets the expectations. Next, we're going to take a look at lesson one, option two. In this lesson, you will analyze the elements of two nature poems in order to compose an original pastoral poem in the style of Eleanor Wiley, William Carlos Williams, or Jennifer Chang. When you think about a time when you were outdoors observing nature, anything in nature, animals, trees, grass, flowers, sunshine, wind, any weather, etc., where were you? What images can you remember? What did you feel while you were there? Next, we'll learn a little bit about pastoral poetry. Pastoral poetry is a type of poetry that dates back to the ancient Greeks. Even after its popularity faded in the 18th century, poets continued to refer to the pastoral style and ideas. Some common characteristics of pastoral poetry include that it presents an idealized vision of simple country life, it describes landscapes of rural countryside, shepherds and their flocks, and the glory of nature, it elevates the pastoral life of the country over the urban or city settings, seeing them as free from the corruptions of city life. And it laments the loss of a simpler and truer connection between humankind and the natural world. All right, let's now take a look at the first two stanzas of the passionate shepherd to his love. This is a traditional pastoral poem, so we will also identify which characteristics of pastoral poetry can be found in these two stanzas. Come live with me and be my love, and we will all the pleasures prove that valleys, groves, hills, and fields, woods, or steepy mountain yields. And we will sit upon the rocks, seeing the shepherds feed their flocks by shallow rivers to whose falls melodious birds sing madrigals. In stanza one, the speaker speaks to his love, saying, come live with me and let's enjoy all the pleasures that can be found in nature. And so you may have noticed that in this description, the poet is elevating the pastoral life, as was mentioned in the characteristics of pastoral poetry. In stanza two, we see the speaker describing lounging on the rocks, watching the shepherds feed their sheep, and listening to the waterfalls and the sweet bird songs. So here we see represented the characteristic of the poet describing the glories of nature as he recounts the landscape of the countryside. Next, you will continue reading The Passionate Shepherd to His Love and identifying characteristics of pastoral poetry that you notice in the poem. Then you will read and analyze one of the four pastoral poems provided to you. So you have a choice from Wild Peaches by Eleanor Wiley, Spring and All by William Carlos Williams, Pastoral by William Carlos Williams, and Pastoral by Jennifer Chang. As you analyze the structure and tone of the poem of your choosing, notice how it both reflects and deviates from traditional pastoral poetry. To close out lesson one, option two, you will compose a poem describing one of your own experiences in nature that closely follows the style of the poem you chose to read and analyze. Do your best to imitate the poet's rhyme scheme, structure, and tone. Your poem should be at least 15 lines in length. Once you move on to lesson two, later this week, you will write your personal narrative in response to this prompt, which we looked at earlier in this segment. You may use your imitation poem from lesson one as a jumping off point for your narrative and complete the personal narrative organizer to plan out your writing. Be sure to review the rubric provided to you to ensure that your writing meets the expectations. 
Thanks for joining me and great job on all of your hard work.